today, we are speaking with a retired gentleman who is a lifelong resident of Chicago. For 25 years, he worked with the Lutheran Church in Africa and was the Continental Desk Director for Africa, supervising 110 missionaries, a broad range of other uh, office holders, people doing the budget, web design, all, all of that. And he is with us today. I'd like to welcome Gaylord Thomas. Welcome, Gaylord. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I, it was specific that I had to introduce myself by saying one wife, six children, six grandchildren. Because working across the continent of Africa and in other societies, one wife is not always the norm. So that's a way of making clear on where my values are. Uh, so that's very important. I'm also a former Vietnam veteran, served 19 months in the war. Now I'm on disability. Out of my 25 years with the Evangelical Lutheran Church, 10 years was the community development director and 12 years was in Africa, uh, working in Africa. During that time, one of the things, one of my greatest accomplishments to myself that I think is that I was able to organize and actually a founder of a, a program for at-risk African-American youth called the Simba Circle. And we've been rolling 27 years. We take anywhere from 50 to 100 males and 50 to 100 young ladies into the woods for, we've had 13 day camps, 10 day camps, but we take them in the woods, isolate them. We take them through what we de design as a purge process to deal with the anger and the madness that they carry and, and try to get down to a, a place in them that's stable and help them to understand that they do have reason and purpose in life. And that's been real successful over the last 25 years. This year is the first year we canceled it or postponed it because we weren't sure how we would deal with an outbreak at the camp uh, with limited facilities in rural areas. So that's, that's a very, very important uh, piece of work, I think. And getting to that work of building that camp was some major bridge building in the Latino and Brown community. So if I'm, if I'm ever arrogant and want to make a bragging statement, I consider myself a major bridge builder between the Latino, brown community, and the black community. Can you say uh, a little bit more about what that looked like, the bridge building? Well, it started in 1992 at the first Urban and Peace and Justice Summit, which was dubbed the Gang Summit. It was held in Kansas City. Uh, there was uh, 216 participants, there was 14 cities represented. There was about 25 of, of, of us who were deemed as observers. And, I, and our sign was to be silent and support. And where traditionally people like us, program directors from organizations go out and run the workshop. That wasn't the case. It was a very, very different type of conference. It was great. I was able to work with those two and build a bridge between the black and brown. So a leader in the, in the Latino community named Daniel J. Alejandras, they call him Nane, which is an elder in Santa Cruz, California, and I embraced each other. I worked with him from a development side, helped to get his organization up, was able to loan money to him and pass grants on while with the church. However, over the years, we've built just a brother-to-brother -brother relationship. He's a former Vietnam veteran. And through his work and my work, we've created this black and brown image across the country. And we got allies from D.C. to San Francisco, from Seattle down to New Mexico. It's a tremendous network. They've come to our, they come to our camps every year and share their sacred uh, rituals. We're able to put black kids from the inner city into some Native American very, very special rituals to help change who they are. It's, it's like good medicine. What year was this conference? 1992 in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. First Urban and Peace Justice Summit. Anything else you want to say about yourself before we go into the questions? Just the other thing, I, I just said all the exciting stuff uh, before, but the reality is right now, the only involvement I have is I usually am the cook. <laughs> so for the last five years, I actually went up and volunteered for both camps and cooked uh, about 54 meals in a row for the what? girls and the boys camp. That's okay. all. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm guessing you must be good at it. I, well, I learned to feed them. <laughs> they eat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I can tell you're kind of modest there. Um, so then let's jump on in. What's your favorite song, either right now or all time? Okay, I got two. My first all-time song was a song that my wife introduced to me when we were dating, and I have them left. It's called Cry, to Cry Together. Okay. My second song is Behold the Lamb, which is a, a very spiritual, uplifting song that I have to use sometimes for my own well-being. Uh, I think Kurt Franklin's people put it on. Tamla Mann sings, sings the lead to it, but so those two. Okay. Um. Tell me a little bit more about the first one that your wife introduced to you. Why, why, why that song? What is it about it? It's about two people having some disagreement and working through it and crying about it. It just puts a different light on who my wife and I are in the journey. We've been together 43 years and uh, we've adopted two kids in that journey. Uh, we try to be parents to each other's kids, even though they're not biological. I'm on the second marriage and she's on the second marriage. You know, it's just like our personal ballot or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That actually, I got it. What you said about it basically signifying the process of continually growing closer, like what that looks like. Yeah. Right. What about a uh, favorite childhood memory? Uh, I probably would say camp. The interesting thing about me was I was the oldest grandchild on my mother's side. And, um, I'm an only child and I had no brothers and sisters. And so for my mother's uh, siblings that moved out of Chicago, I was like the front person. So a little sister just married a guy and joined the Air Force and they moved to Sacramento, California. So for three summers in a row, they would send me to California to day school let out and I'd come back the day before Labor Day and stay with my aunt. So I, I was blessed to be able to travel young, you know, because they were sending me places. Then when my grandfather got older and I got up to about 15 or 16, anywhere he went, I had to go. So that, as I look back, that was a blessing. He would go fishing. He'd go to New York. You know, I can remember riding in old bumpy cars going up and down the, the toll world and stuff. That's so, cool. Yeah, camp or travels like that was my favorite childhood memory. You mentioned already what yeah. I am guessing would be your favorite personal accomplishment. What accomplishment is the one that when others hear it, they are most impressed? That's it, Simba Circle. Yeah. Being an elder and a founding member of the Simba Circle, that's, that's probably the most, it's touched the most people. I've, said, I've had some other personal experiences, but they didn't impact and touch people, you know. Uh, yeah. They were major. You know, I'm curious. I it's not one of the questions here, but just given the breadth of your impact, how would you compare the impact of your role founding Simba versus your role as the Continental Desk Director? Um, the the Simba piece is personal. I mean, I I, I'm, I I live close to the environment where the kids come. I'm with them doing it. So uh, the way I deal with it is, you're in it for life and your investment's different, and then you have to position who you're going to be in this for life. In Africa, I was traveling back and forth. I, I would make an effort like, like I, the, the, I was in it for life, but I wasn't in it for life. I, mean, I was very serious. I was very devoted. I was very committed, but at some time, I was going back home, and they knew that, and I knew that, and so that's the detachment of that commitment was different than some. I figure I have similars carrying me down the house, Paul Bears. So that I'm in in for life. Yeah, I get the I get the clear difference there. What is a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? A guy said one one day he said, uh, one thousand wax at the tree does not equal one at the root. Henry mm. David Thoreau. Mm. And you know, we can yak the yak, yak the yak all day in a meeting planning or executing something, but it's the quicker we get to the root of where we have to go, it, the things will move. So I've used that. Another quote is Marion Wright Edelman, uh, the founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund. I think it was a second book. I'm not sure, but it was called The Measure of Our Success. 
In that book, she says that service to others is the rent we pay for living. Let me give you one more quote that's probably one of the deepest you heard. Stokely Carmichael went over to West Africa early, early in the, late in the 60s, and he got to sit down with this leader in West Africa. And they were sitting down and Stokely told him something about the resistance movement and we have to do this and we have to do that. And the African leader said to him, he said, why are you American, black Americans impatient? Why do we have to get freedom and equality in your lifetime? Why can't we not lay a foundation that'll take a hundred years? And, and the reason that's so deep in a lot of societies around the world, they talk in centuries. You know, we talk year by year, or maybe decades, but Asian people, African people talk in centuries. Anyway. Mm. <laughs> that actually is deep because I think about this movement, this moment that we're in, and there's so much conversation about what to do next, what to do next. And Congress is rushing to act. Local governments are rushing to act. You know, I don't want to dismiss the need for, you know, something to happen in the immediate. But what I don't hear about or see is a think tank that is taking the lead or, you know, who, who is the leadership, the elders, so to speak, of the Black community that is in conversation and doing that thinking that takes us out centuries. So, no, I, I appreciate you putting that in. In terms of things that have impacted your life, what person, moment, conversation stands out as either changing the trajectory of your life or just being among the most significant in your life? Two things I need to say that, that might help inform this. The way I came home from Vietnam is I brought my partner's body home. In the military, anybody killed in action has the right to have a physical escort. And the only the only criteria is they must be in the same branch of service. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine who went to church with me and grew up with me was serving in Vietnam at the same time, got killed, Sergeant Reginald Baker. And his mother decided to bring me home by making me an escort. And when I got home, I stayed in his room for the entire leave I had, 30 days, having a conversation with his mother. So, that sort of changed who I was and what life is about. I mean, you know, I mean, what do we do doing it? I mean, what makes a difference in life? And you might not see that outcome, but understand, you know, I know that those days talking to Miss Baker made a difference. Uh, if I wasn't doing nothing but calming the storm. Um, so, so that was a unique thing from the type dude I am. Um, that changed. And then, 20 years later, I became friends with Black Panther Field Marshal named Geronimo Jigjaga. They called him Geronimo Pratt. Yes. He spent 28 years in prison, and he spent 14 years free uh, before he died. I didn't know him before prison. I met him about six months after he got out and pretty much became his best friend for the 14 years before he passed. And he actually passed in Tanzania in his little, in his house uh, in a place called MBC River. And I was there when it happened and I brought his remains back and put them on his dress in Morgan City, Louisiana. Those two, those two events uh, changed me in a lot of ways. Well, in that first instance, it sounds like the conversations you had with Mrs. Baker were just as impactful as the escorting of your friend's remains. What was it about those conversations that well, impacted you? I mean, you look at, you're looking at the eye of the storm when you're looking at a mother with a, with a son killed on the battlefield. And to the, and the know, the know where that conversation is going to go or to know where that healing process comes or what calms that individual, you know, how, how do you get through that? You know, I mean, you, we, you and I are sitting here right now, we don't know if, they, you know, that one of our kids got killed. How do you get through that? So it was like I was seeing this mechanics work. I was seeing this person at some point come to peace with it, you know, and the statement she would make about, you know, I'm happy I did this or I feel better at this, you know. Um, you know, it was just a very revealing time for me.
and then your friendship with Geronimo Pratt. You know, I could leave it at that, but what is it that had you two become best friends and what did that friendship provide you? Well, by accident, I was working with a project trying to put a development bank in Haiti in the early 90s or mid 90s. And the person put a, get a delegation of black men together uh, to go down there that he thought would help raise money and build this bank. He brought Geronimo on uh, as a revolutionary icon, just to give validity to the whole delegation. That was the first time I met him. Uh, so we traveled together about six days in Haiti, staying in different places, and we just got to know each other. One of the things we had in common is we're about the same size, and we both served in Vietnam. I know he, he you know, he gyrated with that. And I was in a position to help at that time. He was trying to get uh, some grant money and some uh, counsel on how to create a 501c3 in this little small town in Morgan City, uh, Louisiana. So I helped with that, with some counsel and some startup funds. And it just seemed like we had a lot in common and our logic, you know, was on point. Although we didn't, we grew up totally different. He grew up country in Louisiana. He'd go out and kill uh, a mush rat or a rabbit or something for his lunch, you know, before school. And he was living like that country. Wow. And I was living in, in the city, you know. So, but um, we were very close. So then, you know, he eventually built him home in Tanzania. And because that was my catchment area, my job, I was over there six times a year, you know, spending a couple of nights on the front end of my meeting on the back end. Uh, transporting things from. We just had a lot of things in common. And that's another great mind, you know. Out of the 28 years he was incarcerated, 21 of them was in solitary confinement, what they call the SHU, the security housing unit. So he's got stories, you know. A great, great spirit, great character. It's so funny. Uh, when I do these interviews, I just never know who I'm talking to, you know. Because I, yeah. I just, you know, someone says, hey, you know, talk to this guy or, you know, I have a friend. Even like uh, earlier this morning, the interview I had earlier was with my best friend's husband. They've been married 20 something years. Um, their daughter's godmother. He's a pastor. And there are just so many things I learned from asking him these questions in this interview. Like I didn't know his uh, great grandfather was a Buffalo soldier. Like there's just stuff mm. that comes out that mm. you just don't know about the richness of people. So here it is. I'm, you know, some Shedrick mm -hmm. says, Hey, I got a guy, a friend who you should talk to him. And, and you were best friends with Geronimo Pratt. That's just, it's mind blowing who I get to talk to, you know, mm. what is a moment or event that either signifies or highlights your experience or what it is to be a black man in America? That, that itself, I, I went through everything in my head and I thought the, the event was being the escort of bringing his remains back to America. Me and his, one of his sons and another former Black Panther who lives in Tanzania, we put the whole thing together. We cremated it. We set it up, we cremated it. It was decided that I was going to bring his bones, you know, bring the, the jar of, of his remains back. Nah, that was it. I mean, I couldn't, that, that, that's as black as you can get to me. I mean, I asked, you know, to bring the field marshal, the Black Panther Party, uh, to be trusted with his remains was super, super powerful to me. Um, have you had any interactions with law enforcement? When, why, what? Uh, very little, you know, I've been put in cuffs a couple of times. I've never been locked up. You know, when we were 12, we were at the beach in up, up a place called the point on Lake Michigan in the Hyde Park area, Chicago. And two o'clock in the afternoon, the police run and grab us, throw us on the ground and handcuff us face down. And they brought a girl over and she looked at us and she said no, and uh, they let us go, said they're sorry, told us to get out their face, you know, that type thing. She she had said somebody raped her or said something to her, and she, they grabbed her first. I've had a couple of events like that, but I, I, I don't want to testify to the horrors of 
a, a police experience. Later in life, I've worked in the prisons. Part of the work with Simba and other things, we've gone into prisons to work. So I've been in several major uh, maximum facilities uh, and worked with groups. Uh, the prison I worked in the most was uh, called DVI, Dual Vocational Institute. They call it Tracy out in, um, out in uh, right around Stockton, California. I went there about th three times a year. Uh, we did work there. We trained and, and worked with folks in person. Because, see, what, once we started doing this violence prevention movement on the streets, uh, trying to move folks off this madness that they're on and creating this Simba circle and working with black and brown brothers, we knew early on that the most valid, uh, impressive voice was a person who had previously been incarcerated. Somebody who had been through the system, got busted, went to prison, and went through a purge and cleaning process and found their own value and their blessing. Those were the people that people like me had to get foundations and funders and other folks understand that this is the voice that needs to be out here and this madness stopping it. So, you know, we, we had these committees. We had, uh, I used a peace program that I got from Geneva uh, on talking about how barriers add to a decreased peace. You know, religion is a barrier. In some countries, it's Christians and Muslims getting it on. Mm -hmm. you know, and so understanding what all that, that means and how you can apply it on the streets. Uh, you know, I don't know if you heard this, but uh, I think in 1996, after this gang summit, a lot of people went back and tried to construct these summits and truces. And a young Muslim brother who lived in the Nickerson Courts in L.N. Watts took the Camp David Accord that Jimmy Carter signed and took the Camp David Accord and sat down with the Crips and Bloods and they marked it up so it would work for them. And it held for 14 months that I knew of. Wow. So, so you don't have no, you know, no... Uh, like we call invisible people coming out of a project, I'm going to take the Camp David Accord and mark it up so that it works for two rivaling street gangs. That's incredibly genius. Yes. You know, that story is never told, you know? Yes. So. I, I, I love that people going to hear it here. Okay. There's a, a I teach criminal law. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I like to share um, the story of the interrupters. Are you were, are you familiar with them? I'm going to guess you are. Yeah. Well, yeah. We you know early on we started this peace summit. Those were some of the things that the the group of us of the little we we formed an organization of of national and local religi religious leaders that called themselves the things that make for peace. Uh -huh. and, and so we we would uh, we would. Uh, um, advocate within our denominations and with government wherever you get that we had that there's different steps that you have to take mm -hmm. and one of the steps was you got to have somebody on the street who's talking so yeah we we talked about those types of activities whether this woman is a friend a lover a wife or a stranger if america was a woman what would you say to her for three nights, that has haunted me trying to figure out. I've come up with a street response that would go over well, probably on the main line in the prison. I've come up with a uh, a personal response. So I don't know where I like. I, I guess what I'm saying is that you're disrespectful. You ain't got no clothes on. Um, you know how people will say uh, the emperor has no clothes on or the emperor's nude or whatever, you know. And yeah. what, so, sort of what that means, you know, you you out here vulnerable, but most of all, you're disrespectful. So, you you know, your values are real weak. You know, yeah. you've lied, you've cheated, you misrepresented yourself and the family. So, I don't know, uh, run for divorce or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. All right. Um, what is love to you? Being there. I thought about that a lot to being there. I lost my sister-in-law in November and um, my brother-in-law called us. It's his sister. I'm married to his sister. He called me and I got the phone 
And he said, we just lost Loretta. And before I hung up, I was putting my coat on it. And my wife saw my face and me moving, and she started moving too. And it took us like 11 or 12 minutes to get to his house, which is usually a 20 minute drive. But what I'm commenting on is me and my wife just understand what we gotta be now, what we gotta do, you know? And, you know, to roll in there and he was upset. She was still in the house. The paramedics had just left. That's love, being there, you know? Yeah. He saw it that way, you know, and we saw it that way. I told some people I lost a family member and I was stopping, I said, uh, uh, I mean somebody on the Central Committee. I ain't just talking about a cousin in Mississippi or New York or something. I'm talking about somebody we interacted with every day, even though it's a sister-in-law, not necessarily a blood relationship. But anyway, I just, in, in that process, being there, and, and I, I found myself there at least five times at 11.59 in other people's lives. I had a friend's son get killed on the streets, and I was the one, you know, every day for 14 days. You know, I was there. Um, so, you know, long-term commitment is love. Is there anything that we haven't covered about you that challenges some of the stereotypes that exist about Black men? I just want to expound just a little bit on this Black and Brown relationship and this relationship I have with Daniel J. L. J. L. Alejandro's uh, Nane, you know, as you travel through this, you'll probably hear his name again because he's a credible individual and he's got this organization for the last 45 years in Santa Cruz, California called Barrio Chenitos, which uh, at one time had about 30 chapters. They work in prisons. But the relationship him and I have put together has been admired and hated by so many. The brother who runs the Mar one program in Maryland for the Department of Corrections, a Latino brother, he calls me uncle. The brother in uh, Oakland, so -and -so calls me uncle. We sweat together. We call each other, you know, and we, we've made this vow that to each other, we, we all that we can be. And this thing is, it's a tremendous model of, of a black and brown marriage. You know, most, most of the Native American community does not want black people to share in their sacred rituals. You know, they don't want us to have a sweat lodge, Nipi ceremony in the black community. So they went on a risk just to involve us in this. You know, they took a risk within their own people and their own elders and cultures. I remember early on, my people would say, why are you spending time and effort with a Latino brother, with a Chicano brother? There's so many other black people in need. Well, I might give them a few minute answer, but I just, you just didn't understand there's a bigger picture here. We start on the basis that a lot of the, the not only were black on black people killing each other, black and brown and brown on black were killing each other. So it was important for us as a peace movement to broker a relationship, you know, and to show that we could, we, that we could coexist. You know, they, they'll tell you the pie is getting smaller and these are the only resources we have. And we're going to figure out how to split them up between the barrios and the ghetto. And it ain't enough for either. So that pushes you into a fight or a defensive mode out because you're fighting for the same resource. So trying to educate people to understand how that system played was, was deep. There is this um, sense that it's, you know, black versus brown in the hood, and that's just how it is. Right. And I teach at a school that has both. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just beautiful. It, you know, it's just there's a natural getting along. You have to learn to not like, and I, I appreciate the way you explained it as well. I, I can't repeat exactly how you said it, but that, you know, you're taking a piece of pie and you're trying to divide it between two when it's not even enough for one. So right. thank you for that. And so with that, in this process of getting ready for this conversation, having this conversation, is there anything that you're left with or anything that, you know, kind of came up for you or that's new from participating? Uh, it sort of helped me define my frustration right now. First of all, I want to thank you immensely. This does a lot for who we are, for our purpose, our meaning. People like Shed and myself who have been taught to stand and deliver and produce programs and things like that. You know, you get old, don't nobody care what you think. So... It takes about three or four years of transition and retirement to know your place in life. 
Don't nobody want to hear what you guys say. Ain't nobody going to give you the mic. You know, so that that's sort of ego hurting. So it takes a couple of years to heal from that. And, you know, just understand your place after that is just getting some confidence. So us having the mic, really appreciate that. But in this process, one of the things, I was dealing with some frustration on where is this going? How do we move there? Who's the central committee? Who's the leadership? And how are they going? That's an old school screen that we put on things because, you know, we had SNCC, we had CORE, SCLC, then finally the Black Panther Party. So we had our organized entities that we could follow. Well, now it doesn't look like that. But it might be. I don't want, I don't want to say that I'm up on everything. The point that has come out to me that is important is that does this movement today understand building and not just resistance and, and protest? Meaning, okay, you, we get police defunded, we get police out of school, whatever. Who's looking at who we are? My point is, one of the biggest demons out there is gentrification, really. You know, for middle class blacks or lower middle class working people, you know, they've created a scenario where a person working a regular $50,000 a year job and wife working a $50,000 a year can't own a house in some places. So how do we connect with the movement people that having a solid black community and a healthy black middle class is critical to the stability of a movement? They might feel that as a resistance to the community. Those are the, the, those are haves against the have not. But if we don't have a, a, a community or a place in an urban place to live and to do business, then, we'll, you know, we won't be healthy. Last comment, I swear. I'm one of the people that believe we got seriously hurt with integration. I grew up in a segregated black community in Chicago, and the only thing in our community that, that wasn't black most days was white teachers traveled in and white policemen. But everything in our community, the milk company was Joe Lewis Milk. We had a black juice company, black ice cream company, Parker House Sausage. So we were a thriving metropolis at some time. That, that's mean, that's how you produce these fighters. You know, so I, I want to make sure that the new movement leaders understand that you gotta have that base. You know, you gotta have, right after the thing jumped off in Chicago, I put an email out there to one of the organizers that had been through my Semba program. And I said, I, I, I saw your four, your four points, your four ass. I said, I'm pretty impressed with them, I like them. But I want you to stop and think about, we're not in the rebuild mode right now. We're in the recovery mode. You know, the fires ain't just out yet. There's gasoline in the street. So tell me, now that we didn't burn and raided all the Walgreens and CVS drugstores, on the south side, where's these people that can't afford to have a backup supply of insulin gonna get their insulin tomorrow morning? Where are the people who don't have automobiles gonna go to the grocery stores? You know, so, I mean, understand that that's as critical as putting 50,000 people on march. You better figure out how your home base is. So anyway, those practical things concern me, move forward. Thank you, appreciate it. It is my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I'll just say in closing, I just acknowledge the difference you've made in life, not just for African Americans, but Africans and African Americans. Your answer to what is love, almost everything you shared, the accomplishments, the experiences that matter to you, they, they all have that theme. They were about you being there. So I just acknowledge you for being the kind of man who is there <laughs> where you need to be and I, taking the actions. I, I made some major mistakes and hurt some people in my life, Robin. Let me say that. So I'm just trying to build points up for when it comes my time to see if I can get in the gate. I got to clean up <laughs> a lot of mess. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. As you can hear, you do not want to miss any of these brothers. Make sure you subscribe. You can find more at our website, 365brothers.com, 365brothers.com. This is Robin Shine. To listen is to love.